You're listening to the Kitchen Invitation Podcast. Welcome back to your kitchen. Whether you're sick of food rules ruling your kitchen or you want to cook better meals and don't know where to start, you're in the right space. I'm your host and a registered dietitian, Jesse Holden. I like making cooking and nutrition livable, doable, and most importantly, fun. In my community, I'll help you make your own secret sauce to reframing your mindset, cook with confidence, and learn a ton along the way. Are you ready? Then grab your apron and let's get cooking. In the kitchen with me today, we have Mimi Ellis. She is a big picture dietitian whose practice is all about helping people with anosmia and parosmia, which if you don't know what these invisible illnesses are, it's a decrease or lack of taste and or smell. She shares her personal experience with a post-viral anosmia and how it shifted her practice as a dietitian for the second time. First she was an RD, then a PA, then an RD again. She loves to help people cook delicious meals while working on restoring their sense of taste and smell. Enjoy! Welcome Mimi, I'm so excited to have you in the kitchen with us today. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, lost smell eat well. Like what what put you on this path? I will tell you, and I'm joining you from my kitchen too. So Yay. Thank, you, thank you for having for having me. Mm-hmm. So what put me on this path? Uh, there's a lot of pieces to that. Um, it probably started when I was uh, a very small child growing up in a house um, with two parents that immigrated from France. Mm -hmm. We were very uh, food centered and cooking centered. And literally when we were, you know, strong enough to stand up and hold a carrot peeler (laughs) and put on one of the cute little aprons my grandmother used to send us from France, uh, we were in the kitchen with our parents cooking, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, safe age appropriate stuff, obviously. My whole life, my best memories have been around food and the kitchen and the family time and the bonding that happens around all that. So there's that piece. And then, um, as you know, I became um, a dietitian in 93 and then actually went to physician assistant school because I really wanted to do more medical practice. Um, So since 2000, I've been a practicing physician assistant. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, first in general surgery, then OBGYN, and then um, ear, nose, and throat for the last 10 years. Yeah. So the, the second part of that answer is um, as a PA in ear, nose, and throat, I treated um, a handful of patients, really, because it just wasn't very common in the earlier years of my career with smell and taste issues Yeah. and would be just about in tears with them and um, often would leave thinking, oh my gosh, you know, food is such a big part of my life and all things related to, you know, smell and taste. Like if I ever lost that, I'm not sure how I would live, you know? Yeah. Um, And ironically, then it happened to me in 2017. Oh my gosh. So you, oh, okay. Just tell me about that. (laughs) So I, um, I had just had a sinus infection and it was about three weeks out. So I was breathing fine. Yeah, Um, pretty much past it. And I woke up one morning and usually I would open my eyes and from the bedroom, I would smell the wonderful coffee that my husband had just made and be all excited that I was about to get my dopamine hit, you know, (laughs) and I didn't smell anything. And I thought, okay, this is weird. You know, could we be out of coffee? No, that couldn't be. So I came out to the kitchen to see what was up. Um, thinking he just hadn't made the coffee yet. And I looked down, you know, staring at a nice big full pot of freshly brewed coffee. And having treated people with this, I thought, "Uh uh-oh, you know, this is Yeah, like something's not right. Something's not right. So I grabbed the can of coffee and like stuck my whole face in it and sniffed and sniffed and sniffed. And I was getting no information at all. And then I connected the dots and said, oh, I've got post-viral anosmia. And at that time, you know, we just didn't know a lot. There wasn't a lot of research yet. Yeah. And, you know, the conventional wisdom was it might get better. It might not. There's not much you can do to help it and give it six months. If it's not better, you know, it won't get better. Which, by the way, for anybody listening, um, that whole six month thing, I don't know where it came from. Um, I have yet to find any research 
that supports that. So if you've been told that by your ENT, please don't listen. Yeah. Because yeah. There's this thing called neuroplasticity and anybody can get better. Um, and, you know, nobody, despite a white coat and lots of letters after their name, can tell you if and when it's going to happen. That's important to know. And I, I was going to ask that, like, oh, so it's usually about six. Like, that was going to be my question because I received that question a lot when I was seeing clients after um, an outpatient world um, post getting COVID and yeah. their sense of smell. But so um, it, I guess I want to ask, is yours gone? Was it gone completely? Is that a normal post viral thing that happens? It just goes away completely or it fades? Well, I've never even heard of that. It's not normal. I mean, it does happen. Yeah. and post-viral smell loss other than aging is going to be the most common cause. Yeah. Um, and now much more common with COVID. Um, so no, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's normal. No, yeah. um, and it was, it was absolutely, it was zero for me for somewhere between one and two months. Wow. Um, I had absolutely no olfactory information. Mm -hmm. and I know. With, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say with COVID, um, depending on who you ask and what study you're looking at, um, it's around 70 to 80% of people that have COVID that will have smell loss. Mm -hmm. And the, the higher, you know, closer to 80% is in the studies where they actually measured olfaction as opposed to relying on what people said. Sure. <clears throat> and most of them, about three quarters of them will get better within a month. Okay. Um, it's the ones that last longer than a month that are turning out to go, you know, months and months, you know, now even into two years plus, um, you know, many of whom are just, just now starting to get some recovery. Yeah. So, you know, the range, the range is pretty wide. Mm -hmm. yes. So that occurred to you in 2017. Remind me, when did you go back to become an RD and then dive into your own practice of, about this? So I knew, um, you know, even before the pandemic, I kept, you know, I kept thinking, gosh, like, it seems to me that I would be the, you know, the perfect person to help people with the whole, especially the food area around all this yeah. right, background, but I also understand the medical part. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew there was something, you know, I could do with that. But at the time, there just, there weren't very many people. Right um, with this, and, and you know, this is the the sad outcome of the pandemic. Is now we have the last time I looked at the numbers, it was around 330 million people globally mm -hmm. dealing with some kind of post COVID smell loss. You know, beyond a month, mm -hmm. um, and that's you know that's a lot of people. And the the silver lining to that, if there is one, is there's been a ton of research happening in the last couple of years, because suddenly we have people to study, you know, in, in numbers that actually can make a valid study. That, I mean, that makes sense. And that is, you know, also a silver lining in that is like the, the ability to get more research done on that. And I think I saw this on your site um, and I've heard the term before, but I really appreciated it for this one, that invisible illness. Do you think that, do you think people don't come forward about it because they think or assume or they've been told like we'll give it six months and then you know who knows from there like I wonder if there's more people that dealt with it but that just didn't didn't seek care for it or didn't even know that they would have options for that and especially for an RD to be someone they could reach out to about that I think that's just wonderful thank you you know and I think the answer to your question is all of the above you know mm -hmm. um, I know for myself, um, and I was lucky, you know, I worked in a medical practice where, you know, this thing where I didn't smell the coffee that hit me on a Monday morning and I was, I was headed into a full day of clinic <laughs> and I came in the door, you know, stomping yeah. my feet and making, you know, having a big temper tantrum and making sure everybody knew, <laughs> but they all understood. They're like, oh my God, like you're the foodie around here. This wasn't supposed to happen to you. Right. You're like, wait a second. <laughs> this yeah. isn't, so no. like, I understood this was a big deal for me. Yeah. Um, whereas for so many people, they get completely dismissed. They get told something like, oh, well, you should be grateful it's not cancer or, you know, be glad it's not your eyesight or a limb. And yeah. literally when it happened to me, I was like, you know what? I'd rather lose a limb because yeah. I, 
you know, I, there's ways to do what you want to do, or at least most of what I wanted to do in the face of that. But in my mind at the time, I couldn't do the thing that brought me the most joy in my life. Yeah. Well, and like you kind of going back to what you said earlier, your fondest like memories and childhood and growing up were in the kitchen and cooking and participating in that in the whole thing and the memories that you form in there. So to have that essentially taken away, I don't think people realize how devastating it can be to to lose a sense of smell. Like yeah. people, I've I've heard it because I've heard clients say like, well, I try to get my mom to eat or my dad or my sister to eat, but she said she can't smell and I just don't get it. Like, why can't she? just force herself to eat. I'm like, Ooh, it's not that simple. <laughs> no, it's not. Mm-mm. It's not. And especially if you're one of the 50% of people with smell loss, who's dealing with um, what's called parosmia, mm-hmm. which is a horribly distorted sense of smell. And this happens during the recovery process for a lot of people. Often they walk by food being prepared, you know, cooking the kitchen at work, whatever it is. And it triggers this sensation in them where they smell sewage or they smell garbage. Oh, interesting. I didn't even think about that. They literally have to try to force food down while, you know, everything inside them, you know, fight or flight response. It's like revolving. Don't eat this. This is dangerous. Don't do it. Wow. It's not that easy. No, no, it's not. So because, well, because now I'm learning a lot already from this episode. Um, What are like some of the, I don't know, what are some of the first things you like to work on with a person experiencing this? I know I saw that you do a lot of work and it looks like you've done some research on anti-inflammatory meals and things like that, but where do we start with somebody with this? If someone's listening, like, oh my gosh, my I'm experiencing this or my friend, my parent, this, like, what kind of advice could we give them to just get started? Yeah, well, you know, you have to treat it like any other kind of injury or trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, And that means, you know, we have to meet people where they are. We have to look at what's their immediate struggle. Mm -hmm. Um, My very first client was one of those who, you know, not only could she not be in the house. um, I mean, she she basically had one safe room in her house that she could be when people were cooking. And she was from an Italian family. So that was like all the time. Oh, my gosh. Um, (laughs) her parosmia was so bad and she could not, she couldn't get proteins down. She couldn't get vegetables down. She basically subsisted on peanut butter and jelly and donuts for the first year. Wow. And she had, um, she had fatty liver from doing that. Yeah. So, you know, somebody like that, we have to dive in with, okay, you know, I can tell you to go eat your vegetables till the cows come home, but that's not going to happen right now. No. Yeah. Um, We have to, you know, deal with the parosmia and we've got to basically tackle it from, you know, survival mode at this point and figure out what can you get down? What can you keep down? Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people have to do meal replacement drinks. Yeah, I could see that being necessary. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I don't generally recommend that as a long term strategy, but when somebody's in that space and their, you know, their physical health is at stake because they're just not getting the nutrition they need. That's how you've got to, that's where you start. I imagine with, I mean, maybe that particular person or your other clients in the past, you've seen a lot of malnourishment then. You know, one of two things happen, um, either malnourishment like that, or um, sometimes it's overnutrition too. Sure. You know, where people are chasing the pleasure factor and it's just not coming because they don't have the the sensory input or they don't know how to find other ways um, to clue themselves in about the sensory input that is still there yeah, and how to amplify it. So they just keep eating and eating and eating and eating, waiting to feel, you know, more of an emotional pleasure type of, you know, satisfaction, even though maybe their stomach is full. Mm -hmm. Um, So that happens too. Yeah. And I could see both could be very normal responses, like whichever way you and your body go, it's like, it's normal. So I love that you said, and it's such a good reminder to meet people where they're at and and start there and address what's going on first with where they're at now before just like you said, like, I think people misinterpret that about dietitians. Like we're just going to tell people all the time, "Eh, go eat more vegetables, go. Tell them all the stuff they can't eat. So, you know, the first thing I would do is 
you know, look at all that's going on with them medically and figure out, okay, how much can I liberalize their diet? you know, mm-hmm. without doing them harm, of course, but, you know, do right. they really need to be worried about every fat gram right now because of their lipids? You know, maybe that could go on the back burner for six months mm-hmm. without causing them any harm. Yeah, that's a great point because sometimes there's multifactorial things happening with a person. It's not usually, it might, it might be just loss of taste or just loss of smell, but It could also be diabetes on top of it. It could be fatty liver on top of it. Like we have to kind of look and see. Or or the fatty liver that came from, you know, (laughs) basically eating simple carbs and sugar and nothing else. Yeah. You you couldn't get anything else. So what kind of like, are there any general, like, I I asked this in this kind of way, like you you have it on your website, like an anti-inflammatory meal plan. Like, is there some research behind like anti-inflammatory and getting smell back or just like the overall helpfulness of approaching food in that way? That That's a good question. And I'm hoping there will be some research. Yeah. Um, I have not seen any directly correlating anti-inflammatory diet to smell loss recovery. Mm -hmm. (coughs) There are a couple of supplements um, that are anti-inflammatory that have been shown to be, um, to improve recovery when compared to placebo. And we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, sure. Um, but mainly when I started all of this, I picked an anti-inflammatory eating pattern just as a starting point. Yeah. Um, because I felt like it was best suited for most people with most health conditions going on. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then I can see that kind of being a good broad place to give people something to grab to because I think that's important is like offering hope to somebody not false hope of like give it six months and it'll come back like you said earlier right Right. no and it might come back even if they do nothing right yeah exactly um but yeah giving people like something to like start with and I think that's something that's very valuable and like what what are some of those like little tips that we can give somebody who's experiencing this um, well, whether with their cooking or what they're eating and that kind of thing. Well, and the first thing, um, hang on one sec, sorry. Oh, no problem. Take your time. <laughs> Still getting off the, over uh, bronchitis. I thought I was farther along. Um, you know, and even with an anti-inflammatory meal plan, I would say, you know, approach it lightly because it's more important that you get nutrition down and I would rather have somebody, you know, eat a little more sugar than is optimal if that's what they need to do to get, you know, the broader picture of yeah. the nutrition. So I'd say don't, you know, don't over restrict. But, um, you know, the thing that can help the most is approach eating and cooking from a place of curiosity. Yeah. An investigation and being a little bit like a detective as opposed to what I see so many people do is they just go into every meal or every, you know, experience in the kitchen and they want it to be exactly like before. Mm. And if it's not exactly like before, then nothing is any better. It's this very black and white thinking. Um, And ultimately, you know, after an injury or trauma, yeah, we can recover a lot, but most people who have had a significant injury or trauma can say, yeah, I got a lot better, but you know, and no, it's not exactly like it was before. Mm -hmm. Um, And here are some things that I've done to make my life at least as good as before, even though maybe it looks different than what I thought it should look like. Mm -hmm. That's, That's an interesting take, because I do think that can really be hard in the kitchen with people if they want it to look a certain way, be a certain way, and then it doesn't meet that expectation. I find I, I would think the disappointment would be greater and then the desire to cook would go down. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was there when this um, first happened. Um, I literally took all my cookbooks and threw them in a big box and put them in the garage because I couldn't look at them. Yeah, it was it was that hard to like it was, it see was that these hard options. just thinking about okay, how 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 am I gonna ever make this enjoyable again? I just couldn't couldn't picture it yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So even like you say, something is just kind of meeting people where they're at when they're experiencing this might just be focusing first on like, how do we get nourished <laughs> again? Uh, how do we get that baseline up? 
it's not just about like let's get your smell back it sounds like it's more about like let's figure out how to get your needs met almost not in any way possible but yeah in any way we can because it's important right and i think as dietitians it's our role can be important dietitians health coaches you know mm -hmm. other culinary and nutrition professionals um is for us to educate the patient um, that maybe I can't get you your smell back exactly like it was before. I probably can't. However, you know, the need to attend to your health doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can put it on the back burner for a year and you might end up like my first client, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> who is now doing well, but we had, you know, we had a lot of work to do to get her, you know, set back on a good path yeah so that that is important definitely and are there i guess i'm i i didn't put this in our questions ahead of time but this question is <laughs> popping into my head um previously in my outpatient work i would work with um cancer patients whether they were actively going through pa um going through treatments or post-treatment um and as you probably are aware loss of a sense of smell or taste can be happening in that population yeah and it was all like trying to find information like what would help them maybe get more taste so are there things that people can do with their food or with like in between eating that helps to maybe amplify taste or because I don't actually know the true answer yeah. to that I'm just curious yeah. well so let's let's tease out the language a little bit so that mm -hmm. the answer will make more sense yeah um, and the other thing I was going to say for anybody that's had um, smell or taste disturbance for more than a month, even if it's post COVID, go say, see an ENT. Mm. Um, they may not, you know, be able to um, offer you lots of time and empathy and all of that, but they'll get a good look under the hood and make sure you don't have something else going on that sure. could be remedied that's, you know, going to be important and all that. So that's yeah. important. Um, just a quick a quick note about that. You don't want to skip that. Yeah. But um, the what you oh so we were going to talk about the language. So people will come. They'll come to me all the time and say, I can't taste anything. I can't taste anything. And I'll go, Okay. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, my coffee it just doesn't taste as good as usual. Or mm -hmm. the dinner I had last night, you know, it just didn't have any flavor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then what you want to kind of pick through is well, what happens like if you put a little bit of sugar on your tongue. Can you tell that's sweet? Well, yeah. Okay, what happens if you put some salt on your tongue? Can you tell that that's salty? Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what about a little acid or vinegar to give you sour? Um, you can bite down on a couple of celery seeds. Um, that's gonna give you bitter. Uh -huh. And then for umami, like if somebody wants to kind of test themselves and see, okay, can I actually taste or not? Yeah. Um, soy sauce is a good one for umami. Mm -hmm. a little soy sauce on there. So most people, when they do that, will realize, oh yeah, I can taste. So what's happening is they're getting the five true tastes, mm -hmm. um, which come from the tongue and the nerves that innervate the tongue. Yeah. Well, as flavor, um, the thing that makes your coffee so delicious and tells you this is such and such from Starbucks and not um, Cafe Bustella from you know, Walmart <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Um, no disrespect. Um, <laughs> no. But the thing that tells you the difference, that's flavor. And flavor comes from olfaction, your sense of smell. Mm, so people are maybe mis misunderstanding what, what is happening. Actually, or... yep. Okay, gotcha. So the first thing to do is to try to tease that out. Mm -hmm. And then say, okay, so maybe we don't have flavor right now. We're going to get flavor back probably very gradually, maybe not as good as it before, but we can improve that by retraining your olfactory system. So there is um, smell training or olfactory training. Interesting. And twice a day for five minutes, is it's actually the, uh, the most consistently studied intervention that's been shown to help um, over time. So mm -hmm. it doesn't work right away. So just like rehabbing, if you've had an injury and you have to learn to walk and talk again, you're going to work on it a little bit every day, mm -hmm. right? And you're not going to expect to see results tomorrow. It's going to mm -hmm. take time. 
So it's not like eating is the work. It's not like, well, I cooked a meal. This is what counts as it. Like there's an actual, because I literally never heard this before. There's like a five minute thing to do twice a day that like. Yeah. So, okay. so olfactory training was initially studied by um, a gentleman named Thomas Hummel, who's a physician and um, researcher in Germany. Mm-hmm. And what he did was he took, he he took four scents and he basically said, okay, let's have something flowery, something citrusy, something spicy, and something kind of resinous. Yeah. So by default, it was rose, clove, lemon, and eucalyptus. And he had people practice smelling them and you want to do it. Your audience can't see me, but um, you want to have something ideally with an opening of about two inches. So Mm -hmm. what I'm showing here is a small, shallow, um, this is a tin um, it's non-reactive, but you could also use um, glass containers. Uh-huh. They're going to cost more to ship because they're heavier. Sure. Um, or you can use these little inhaler tubes that you can get on Amazon, and they have a wick inside. You basically put it together yourself and put, I put about 10 to 20 drops of the oil on the wick. Yeah. And then you're going to wave it back and forth in front of your nose mm-hmm. for about, 20 to 30 seconds. And while you do it, you're going to very vividly picture in your mind, what, what do I recall this thing that I'm smelling? What did it smell like? So even if your nose isn't giving you the information, you're going to really try and picture it very vividly while the stimulus is in front of your nose. Oh my goodness. That is so fascinating. That yeah. it is, I mean, again, you were, you're saying like, treat it like an injury, treat it like a trauma, which right. I Connecting those dots, but now that you've also brought in like there's like a, a rehab piece to it, like that, like do it's this exactly. It's rehab for your brain and your olfactory nerves. Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's um, so. And, you know, you worked in rehab, so you saw neuroplasticity at work, right? I, I did, but I've never <laughs> learned about like this olfactory training, and I'm like, yeah. I'm a little sad about it. <laughs> Well, you know, and it's funny because um, people weren't teaching about it when I lost my sense of smell. And the reason I kept digging was because, like I told you before when we were talking, I have a daughter with dwarfism. Mm -hmm. Um, She's cognitively completely normal. She's three foot 11 at age 20. That's as tall as she's going to get. She's got short arms and legs. Yeah. Um, But we actually um, trained with a swim coach and swam on a swim team with several Paralympic swimmers. Yeah. And during that process, I literally met kids who were not predicted to ever walk or talk again, mm-hmm. who were going off to college. And yeah. I scratched my head and was like, well, well, if that's possible, then surely there has to be a way to retrain our smell. Yeah, yeah. And I kept digging and digging and digging, and I found Thomas Hummel's study, and I found um, a woman named Chrissy Kelly in the UK who has started um, a large nonprofit there now. And she was just starting out teaching some... Um, olfactory retraining classes a couple times a year and I connected with her pretty quickly Mm -hmm. um so I I credit um I credit her to saving me (laughs) yeah (laughs) well that's amazing and um oh my gosh I just I I'm like like I said I think I'm a little sad though that I didn't know that because I was seeing I was still seeing patients in the clinical world where I was and they were dealing with like loss of smell and stuff and I feel like the information I had was again more related to cancer treatments and right. um and, and even more so like dry mouth and different things happening right. more in the mouth but oh, I just find that really fascinating that yeah. is, that's incredible yeah and you know and for cancer treatment most um most of those changes are going to be transient mm-hmm. um, obviously it depends with head and neck cancers you know it totally depends where's the lesion what's the treatment what else is it going to damage in the way of you know, smell, taste. And then there's a third thing happening, our trigeminal nerve, which is what, what tells you when you just bit down on a Thai chili pepper. Yeah. That's your trigeminal nerve. The oh, thing that, okay. thing that gives you the sensation of the burn. And for COVID, sometimes that's knocked out for a little bit too, as well as true taste. Mm-hmm. Um, but typically it's the olfaction part that lasts a long time. Interesting. Oh, I find that really, I just, I'm loving this, Mimi. This is really, this is fun for me to learn and to just share these with the people who are listening. And so um, you mentioned earlier, like sometimes there are supplements that can help or is that like in the early stages or just tell me a little bit more about that? So, so most of the studies are done on people within six to 12 months. Okay. Um, but, you know, 
I have actually heard um, somebody in one of the Facebook groups who had a head injury 30 years prior, just completely gave up on ever being able to smell again. And she learned about smell training as the pandemic and, you know, things have been in the news and all that. And she thought, what the heck, let me try it. Yeah. She started being able to smell again. So, you know, my my feeling was it's never too late. Mm -hmm. Um, And our olfactory neurons are always regenerating. So, you know, regardless of where you are in your recovery, um, first check with your primary care provider, you know, about safety. Mm-hmm. But the couple things I would consider are omega-3 fatty acids. Mm-hmm. And there, there is a, a pretty large study in the U.S. that just finished, um, they just finished collecting data. I haven't actually seen the results published yet, but <coughs> it was sounding pretty promising. Um, zinc is important. They have not done any studies yet showing direct correlation, but zinc deficiency is pretty um, pretty prevalent. Yeah. And there's definitely a, an association between lower zinc levels and poor levels of smell. So um, zinc supplementation, if somebody can tolerate it, you know, 40 to no more than 50 um, milligrams a day. Mm-hmm. And then this is one I had to like practice pronouncing. There is something called palmitoyl ethanolamide. Okay. Combined with luteolin, luteolin is a phytochemical, which we learned about um, Mm -hmm. in school, but there's uh, a supplement that has those two things combined. And there was recently an Italian study published just in the spring. And that showed really promising results um, compared to um, it was double blinded, placebo controlled. Yeah. Um, the experimental group had the supplement and smell training, and then the control group had the placebo and smell training. And the group with the supplement got, I want to say, about fifty percent more improvement. Wow. Um, wow. After I don't remember what the study time was, if it was three or six months, but mm-hmm. that was pretty promising. Yeah. Well, that's very exciting. And again, I think, like you said, um, a silver lining of COVID was like seeing more research coming out with this and there is a time and place for supplements you know I know you you get that as a dietitian and I get that but and like you said you know talk to your doctor like get labs drawn maybe to see where you're at with some of these things but um I I just I have to bring this up since we were talking about this earlier whenever we talk about a word that we're like I had to practice pronouncing it I hate when I see people post online or anything they're like if you can't pronounce it don't eat it don't take it I'm like man you're so you're so not on the right page because like there are things out there that yes okay they're harder to pronounce but they could be so beneficial like that I, I had to throw that out there we were talking about that earlier funny. Funny. yeah oh and a, and a note on that so palmitoyl yes. ethanolamide is uh, abbreviated PEA uh-huh if you google it be warned there is another compound out there that goes by PEA which is mm. something completely different um, that's being studied for other things and, and has nothing to do with palmitoyl ethanolamide. So just make sure that you're searching the right thing. If you search it, I'll have to make sure I'll put the, uh, the right spelling and the right word in the description below everybody. Yeah, so that we don't, don't, don't miss that. that. Um, if you like, it's absolutely. Definitely. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I think I, I like that about this and for everyone listening, I like to try to put things in the description that you can read studies on like if you want to dive further into the research of it um because that's where we want to get our (laughs) exactly we want to get that information from a legit source (laughs) that's so important um okay so tell me a little bit more about the meal subscription services that you offer on your site (laughs) i just want to hear what you're doing for people with that so so like you i am primarily a culinary nutritionist Uh uh-huh um, I'm also a big picture nutritionist. Yeah. Um, although I do a little bit of integrative, you know, nutrition and medicine stuff. Yeah. Oh, I like that word. Yeah. Big picture. Um, but um, the meal planning. So one of the things that I've learned is that one of the biggest barriers for people to actually execute, um, and I almost hate the word healthy, but um, I know it. You know, to to execute nutritious, um, you know, cooking and eat or cooking, eat, eating habits is competency in the kitchen and feeling confident and comfortable and having some basic skills and some practice. Mm -hmm. 
So I got interested in that and became a um, basically became part of a large um, what's the right word uh, collaborative of culinary nutritionists and dietitians. And the person who started that collaborative actually hired software developers to develop uh, menu planning software that basically she, she had them reverse engineer it because as a new dietitian coming out of her training, she found that all the, the menu planners that were out there delivered recipes that she would look at and go, nobody's going to eat this. Right. It's it terrible. She was actually a culinary coach before becoming a dietitian. Okay. So she hired her own software engineers and basically gave them, okay, this is what people, you know, will eat. This meets, you know, our nutrition goals for this particular population, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. You guys engineer the software to make a digital planner where people can pull in and pull out and, you know, um, drag and drop things into their plan. They can scale up or down depending on how much they need. They can have all the ingredients for the recipes they want to do that week drop into a smart shopping list. That's incredible. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So it does all of that. <coughs> and as a dietitian subscribing to this collaborative, I also have a way to create my own signature plans. Awesome. So I created a signature plan out of the anti-inflammatory guidelines and basically added taste, flavor, color, texture, um, for people with parosmia, just about every recipe has instructions in there for if you're dealing with parosmia and you can't do onions, take those out and put this in. Um, gotcha. yeah, so basically addresses the things they struggle with, um, and gives them modifications for how to, how to make it work. What a great tool to use alongside working with somebody like you too, to be like, okay, I'm trying this and you've already given me the modification. And maybe as, as a culinary dietitian, you can also be like, okay, I can also show you how to do this or how to tweak it or how to do that. Right. What a great tool for them. Yep. And I actually do the how part in, um, I've got some online culinary online nutrition courses. Oh, great. <laughs> with um, each, each month has a, a separate um, nutrition focus. Mm -hmm. And then there's a series, it's a four week course. And then there's a series of about 20, um, culinary videos. They're pretty short. Um, and then each one of them has modifications for, you know, whether they're dealing with just smell loss and they need things to have more taste, flavor, color, texture, mm -hmm. um, or if they're really dealing with parosmia and they need to completely revamp something to make it work totally that no I just think again I'm just like I'm very excited you're on this podcast today Mimi I'm learning so much like, I know our <laughs> well, listeners are valuing yeah. yeah and I know they're getting I can I know people will get value out of this um I also because I like digging into people's websites that you do a hack of the month so um what are some of the recent hacks that you have put out there for people because sometimes even just if they're not ready to dive into a course or get meal plans or even working with a dietitian, if they're not there yet, even just being able to come to somebody's site and get like a little, a little tip to move you forward in some way, shape or form can be great. So what are some of the hacks of the month that you've done? So I've done um, a few different ones and I'm actually turning that into more of a blog. Oh, cool. <laughs> so if you go back and look, you'll see it's different, but the content is just getting reworked, but it's all going to be the same. Yeah. But sometimes it's um, just sharing a favorite, you know, high protein smoothie recipe mm -hmm. um, this time last year. And I actually just reposted it. I did a, a pumpkin smoothie that's high protein, uh, vegan based protein. It's vanilla and like pumpkin pie spice, which a lot of people with parosmia can tolerate very well. Even oh, though okay. things are disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> I put that out there, you know, one month. Um, another one I talked about, um, lemons and citrus and just the general, the general discovery myself early on was that I needed more acid mm -hmm. in just about everything I was eating because it, everything just tasted flat. Sure. So, you know, lemons and limes are always in my fridge and I have a couple other products that I keep on hand for when I run out. So that was one of the, one of the tips just for improving flavor. Yeah. Um, another month I did about mindfulness. 
Mm -hmm. Because so often, you know, people complain, oh, I can't taste anything. Well, okay. Are you actually sitting down to try to taste that and like putting your cell phone away? Sure. Yeah. Tuning you into know? it. Like you said, it is such a connection with our brain. It sounds like with that olfactory retraining process that it would be important to try to emphasize mindfulness when you're eating. Yes. Yep. Mindful eating. So all of those things. And then um, this month's post is, uh, I called it cookies for breakfast. Love it. I found a nice, uh, not too sweet, gluten-free scone recipe, gluten-free because I recently found that um, I've had to go that direction, uh -huh. but it's, um, it's got three different, um, three different variations with, again, lots of texture and color and different taste and flavors going on that make it fun yeah. for somebody, even if they're, you know, completely without smell at this point. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. And and so anyone listening, like maybe even just go back and look through some of her other hacks and things that she shared on her website. Um, I guess I have one last question for you, but I was thinking about this a bit of the time. If somebody, if you went through the different tastes, like you said for yourself, you needed more acid. Was that mm -hmm. because you recognized when you tried to taste it on its own, it just was falling flat. So you were emphasizing that in your <laughs> So if I wasn't tasting maybe salt as much, we would want to, well, we don't always want to increase salt, but it depends on where we're at. Um, yeah. I get, you get what I'm saying? Like, is it like emphasize yeah. more of this when we're having less of that in our taste? You know, I think probably all of the above, depending on the person, sure. but what I, you know, I went for almost two months where all I had was sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and umami. Mm-hmm. So if I didn't have some sour to balance the sweet and a little bit of salty, things just were really boring. Okay. So that's what you mean when like they fell flat. Like I like that terminology for it. That's a great way to describe it. You know, and it's funny because I think back to um, a William Sonoma recipe I have in my, my French William Sonoma cookbook. Uh-huh. And it's for a soup that um, it's just like something my grandfather made. And I was making it and I thought it was really strange at the very end, they have you put like two teaspoons of lemon juice in and it's kind of like a creamy pureed vegetable soup with potatoes and leeks and carrots, I think. Yeah. And I thought it was strange, but I remember tasting the difference and going, oh yeah, like this is just totally brightens this up. Mm -hmm. um, so I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, and maybe it's just something that balances things better. But, um, yeah. but one thing I will throw out, um, for people that have to be really careful about salt, mm -hmm. um, my, my functional medicine people always cringe when they hear me say this, but if you don't have migraines or seizures um, or anything bad that happens when you have monosodium glutamate, mm. adding a little bit to your food, um, it gives you the umami taste. Yeah. Yes. And they've actually studied this in elderly nursing home patients. They were able to significantly improve people's oral intake by adding just a little bit of that to their food. And remember, MSG is naturally occurring in food. Yes, I, I, I don't think that's well known at all because it's become so demonized in the public eye. But I really love and appreciate that you shared that because um, I think now that I'm in this culinary world, I've gotten asked that question multiple times, like, is MSG really okay? And it's like, yep. And, and it sounds like it even serves a really important purpose. If you're going through this, it could be really helpful. Well, and you can, you can improve, um, taste a lot in food without adding as much sodium. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because gram per gram, it doesn't have as much sodium as table salt. Yeah. And, and like you said, so I guess with your whole background and your personal experience with that too, I, I always think that's very valuable when you're working with somebody. Um, it just seems like getting in the kitchen and finding a way to make it work for you in the best way possible, meeting people where they're at, like setting expectations reasonably, um, but also just building that confidence in the kitchen is something you, I can tell you feel passionate about helping people with. I think that's yeah. great. Right. Because at the end of the day, you know, especially when we're at 8% inflation, right? It's something we all need to be doing more of. Yes, absolutely. I know. Yeah. Groceries high, but um, eating out even higher <laughs> right now. Yeah. So, oh, Mimi, I'm so appreciative of you being here today. Is there anything else we can share about you? I want to know where can people find you? Um, all right, and I'm going to add everything for everybody in the description below, but just tell us where we can get some more information about you. 
So you can go to my website, which is uh, lostsmelleatwell.com. Love it. So that's easy. And um, let's see. You can find me on Facebook at uh, Eating Well When You Can't Smell. Mm-hmm. And then my Instagram account is the same as the website. So it's Lost Smell Eat Well. Awesome. So everybody, we will link all of that below. Any any final notes, Mimi, that you want to share with everybody? Um, yeah, I want to let everybody know that for um, early February, in the spirit of uh, Valentine's Day, I will um, issue a 40% discount on my um, Can't Smell, Eat Well um, menu planner um, through Valentine's Day through the 14th. Very exciting. All right, everybody use that. Use that code. Go find her. Oh, and the code is be my Valentine. Be my Valentine. Perfect. We'll put that in the link as well down in the description. Um, Thank you again very much, Mimi. I, I found this really helpful and I know our listeners do too. And just thank you again so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's been great chatting. You bet. All righty, everybody. We will see you all next week in the kitchen.